Uh, thank you, and God bless you. In our lifetime, the evangelist has been the star of the church, uh, the person that could command a large audience, and, and, and the person that could uh, give rhetoric uh, was the star. Uh, possibly that was completely wrong. For example, the communists did it the other way. Uh, the, the, the communists, beginning with 17 people, began to teach. You might be appalled to know that uh, communist Russia uh, actually absorbed China and, co and brought it into being a communist state through literature, through teaching. And you'd be amazed that after Christianity had been there for a hundred years, over half the people in China had never heard the word Jesus. And that the communists came in just a few years, there was no one that didn't know the name of Karl Marx and Stalin and Lenin and Mao. Uh, possibly we're getting on the track now of teaching. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, it says that the Lord Jesus Christ was a teacher in the synagogues and that he was a preacher of the kingdom and that he was a healer of the people. It, it, it is carnal to reverse those. It's human to reverse them. We'd all like to be alleviated of our pain, you know, a healer. So we would like to put Christ first, the healer. We'd like to even have him heal us and let us continue to live in our sins. And let, it, let us continue to do as we please in rebellion. But he is not a healer first. He is a conveyor of truth first. And you say, well, why? Well, to preach means that you ask people to receive the gospel, and the gospel, of course, is salvation. Well, you can conceive one in the gospel and bring them into a very shallow experience where they won't, they say, yes, I am saved. You say, saved from what? You say, well, I don't know. And what do you believe? Well, I believe it all, but I don't know what it is, you see. And so you, you have a Christian that is moved by every wind of doctrine. But the Lord Jesus was first a teacher as he went throughout the land. Uh, they didn't accuse him of being a preacher. They said, thou art a teacher come from God. So he had made the impact of being a teacher upon the people of his time. Maybe in our time we lost that. And we, we, we elevated the evangelists superbly throughout the world, that he was the key person. And maybe after that, the pastor, you know, we, we elevated. Uh, but the teacher part, uh, we, we subordinated. We have come to the moment now, I believe, where we're seeing the value of teaching and the strength of teaching. And that if a person knows something first, when he makes a decision, he makes it upon a basis of knowledge. He knows something. And then you can keep a person. Uh, a person that makes a decision on the basis of knowledge will retain that decision. When a person has made a, a decision on, the, on an emotional response, he feels happy, he feels glad, but what if the <laughs> happiness and gladness goes away? Uh, and then he's back to zero. He says, I've lost my salvation, I'm not happy. No, your salvation is not based upon happiness. It's based upon a declaration that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he is the Savior of your soul. And if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. It's based upon truth. Amen. And your feeling or not feeling is immaterial, actually. It's all right to feel good. But it isn't necessary to have a feeling about it. It's necessary to have a knowledge about it. In this series of lessons on alien entities, we are giving basic and fundamental truth that the total body should know about. In the world that we live in today, there are literally millions of people that we call them a schizophrenic. And, and our lesson we're dealing with it is schizophrenic, an alien entity. Now, as with our last lesson, uh, we have to be careful with, uh, with substance of this nature. Uh, we do have people in our world that are very careless they say, oh, I see you have a devil. And you don't really have one, they just upset at you. And, and, and if a man comes to me and says, you know, my wife is possessed of the devil. Well, I actually know they've just had a quarrel, you see. And when the quarrel's over, everything will be all right again. Uh, and, and so we're not, we don't, I don't think we should use these kind of things lightly. That when we speak of a person being possessed, we should know what we're talking about. And that when we class all sickness, you know, as a possession, uh, then, we, you know, we are wrong. There's no doubt about it. We are wrong. So let's get 
our, our facts and our truths related to one another so that they, so that we can, in any kind of a storm, in any kind of a debate, in, in any kind of opposition, we can always stand on our truths. You know, nobody can push us around and say, oh, you're crazy, you think everybody has a devil. Just straighten them out in a hurry and say, we understand alien entities when we meet them. And you better know it. Well, that'll, you know, that'll stop them dead right there. And, and, and then you, you continue from there and send that. But when we do find alien entities, we also know what to do with them too, which they don't. Hey, that's a good place to be, isn't it? All right. And in 2 Timothy 1 and 7, it says, God hath not given us uh, by us, uh, it, it, it reflects to the body of Christ. It is not talking about sinners. Of course, God don't give it to sinners either. But it's always good when you read something to know who, who is being addressed. And when you know who is being addressed, then you, for example, in 1 Corinthians uh, 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 12 and 1, it says, Brethren, concerning spiritual gifts, I would not have you to be ignorant. Now, how many knows I misquoted that? Yeah, the word, the word brethren is in the middle of the sentence, and I put it in the beginning of it. You see? It actually says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. But I turned it around and put the word brethren first, and in the original language it might have been that way anyway. And I, but I wanted to know who is being addressed before you give the address. You got it? Uh, and, and then you know, you know what to think about, and you know how to person. If he's talking to sinners, it's one thing. If he's talking to the whole world, it's one thing. Uh, and, and John 3, 16, he is addressing the world. He is not addressing the church. He is addressing the world. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Well, you know, you know who he's talking about. Japanese, Chinese, he's talking to everybody. But uh, when he says brethren, he is not addressing the world. He is addressing born again believers, part of the body of Christ. Can you say amen? So now it says God has not given us. Who is us? It's the body. It, it, it's, the, it's the believers. It's the redeemed ones. It's the born againers. God has not given the born-again people, uh, the, the, the spirit-filled people, he has not given them the spirit of fear. Now, you should make a little circle there where it says spirit of fear. We don't believe the Bible makes mistakes. Uh, fear uh, in its ultimate is a spirit, not, not in its primary stages. Uh, in its primary stages, uh, fear is, is believing a lie. There's a booger man. There's a booger man inside that room there. If you go in there, the booger man will get you. That's what stupid parents teach innocent little children. Are you still here? <laughs> okay, well, don't ever do it then. Uh, that it's wrong to create a, a, a fear image in your child. They can carry it throughout their whole life. And, and God is not a God of fear. Uh, he is a God of liberation. He is a God of freedom. Uh, he is a God that sets people into a place of joy, and fear has no joy in it. Fear has terror in it, but fear has no joy. He says, God has not given the body of Christ a spirit of fear. That's the ultimate, uh, uh, that, that's the ultimate realities of fear. That's when fear has become your master and is dominating your life and throwing your, your, your solical parts out of focus, your mind, your emotions, and your willpower, throwing it out of focus, and, and that you don't see things properly and as they are. You better get that because that's what fear really is. Now, God has not given us any spirit of fear, but he has given us three things. He has given us the spirit of power. Now, power is two things. Power is authority and power is energy. That the policeman, the policeman has the power of authority. That, that when he blows the whistle, you stop, you see. He has a power of authority. The man that's in charge of the, the building commission in, in our city can come and put a little yellow note on your building and you do not continue to build. He is the power of authority. The little note means he has a job, he has a position, and you obey it whether you like it or not. And so power is two things. It is, it, it is authority and it is energy. Now we have those two. Our very presence is strength. How many realize that? Yeah. You can walk into a room and you walk in there, you are there as an entity, you know, of God and of faith. And, and, and if, if, if it's full of sinful people, immediately they'll start trembling and say, hey, here's one that's not of us. <laughs> yeah, you better know that. Uh, and so we... And, you know, the, 
The centurion said to Jesus, speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. See, that's authority. See, that's not energy. That is authority. And, and so we, we have power. And God says he's given us that spirit of power. Then he has given us a spirit of love. Then he's given us a spirit of a sound mind. Now, that's a good sermon for you to, to just to preach it again and again. The three gifts of God is a spirit of power divided into two sections. A spirit of love. Love is of God. Love has no torment. Uh, perfect love casteth out fear. And, 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 and then of a sound mind. Who is it that has a sound mind? Thinking today, thinking tomorrow, thinking for eternity. Who has a sound mind? It's a man that's born again. He knows where he's going to spend eternity. He knows his relationships are the unknown. And, and the sinner man does not know that. In our medical world, it states that a schizophrenic disorders of the human mind are greatly on the increase. And I'm very sad. I'm very sad that in a modern world with modern technologies that we have an increase of a thing that should be decreasing. But these things come about through a spiritual causes. Spiritual and moral causes bring these things about. It is believed that the strain, stresses, disappointments, disillusionments facing this generation have a lot to do with this increase. There's a sermon for you uh, right there. What causes a schizophrenic situation in a person and, and, and the strains. You get pulled about 40 different ways in one day, brother, and you've had it. It's time to go to bed and rest a while. And you have enough stresses. You've got to do this, you've got to do that, and you're struggling with, a, with all kinds of things from, from examinations up and down. And, and then you load that with a few disappointments. No letter from your girlfriend. That can get you down. What was it you said? All right. And disillusionments, <laughs> you know, are facing this generation. Uh, they, they have a lot to do with this increase of a problem that has to do with the human mind, as I'll be showing you in just a moment. Medical scientists believe that schizophrenics possess dual or, or multiple personalities. Now, now, that's where we get into our share of this thing. We get into the spiritual relationship to this when we have a human being, a human being who within himself has more than one personality that expresses itself in his, business, in his life. Scientists identify schizophrenia by action and reaction. And the action and the reaction is related to normal and accepted behavior. You know, if you and I walk upright and here comes a man crawling on his knees, we say he's not behaving like us. That, that's not the way to do it. Or if we see him on his back throwing out his arms and trying to move along on his back, we say, well, that's not, that's not the kind of behavior that we call normal, you see. And so they judge, they judge schizophrenics in that they do not behave as what you and I call normal behavior. So that's the reason they put in them into a certain category. Now, simply speaking, schizophrenia is a mental mind. It's a mind disorder. It is characterized by a splitting of the human personality, dissecting it, you see. And it's disassociation from positive actions and, and, and or emotional deterioration to where one time they knew two and two was four, and then suddenly it becomes five. You say, well, now that is not exactly normal when two and two equal five. And so this is the, the way that medical science comes to understand the problems of a fellow human being that is sick in the mind. Now, we come to point one here, which is very uh, telling. About 30 million people of our country, and I want to tell you in their other countries, those that have gone through wars, that people have been blasted to pieces, uh, are those that are living in, in a terror place like in Central America and the Near East and places like that where terror is on every hand, uh, my friend, if you knew the number of people that are hurt mentally, it would, it would crush you. It would crush you. So about 30 million of our own people suffer from schizophrenia or other uh, psychiatric problems. One million five hundred thousand of these people require hospitalization right now. And due to these mental torments. Now, this is an army of people, and for you and me, it's human beings that we need to help and to bless and to love. Now, medical science, uh, through its public uh, mental health systems, uh, deals with these problems in many ways. Um, medical science attempts to help these people by what they call electroshock therapy. And, and they shoot you, your, your body, they, like when they electrocute a man, they give you just a little less than that. And, and they try to take your, your, your nervous system and to shock it into reality. Uh, I, I, I don't know that I have 
very much confidence personally that you can be shocked into reality. But they say that some have been helped this way, and I think others have been deteriorated by the same. Then they have what they call an insulin th uh, a th a therapy in which they inject into you uh, uh, insulin and hoping that it will bring your mind back into a, a normal pattern of thinking. And then they have a drug therapy with this antipsychotic, antidepressant, anti-maniac, and mega vitamin treatments in which they, through drugs, hope to bring you to uh, an area uh, that we call normal. There is no positive or sure cure for schizophrenia. And, and you better underline that. Every doctor in the world will tell you exactly the same. And you might write the pretty little word Jesus right underneath it. They say, yeah, but they didn't count on Jesus. There is no positive or sure cure schizophrenia and other sorts of mental illness. I mean, I mean that mental illness is a thing that eludes the medical profession of the world today. They spend millions and I suppose billions of dollars in that area, uh, but it eludes them. Doctors have almost produced a dictionary of words describing the human mental problem. And, and uh, that's, that's a thing you ought to have a strong, strong, strong look at. For example, science says that mentally ill people are characterized by one or more of these descriptions. Uh, schizophrenic is a psychosis of unknown origin. That's their dictionary. It's, it's the, the disorganized thinking of a mental truth. You see, there is a truth, but they, but they are disorganized in thinking about it. Uh, they do not understand the reality of facts, that a fact is not a fact, that white is not white, black is not black, they're somewhere in the gray. And, and so then they said that you are a schizophrenic then. Uh, schizophrenia comes from two Greek words, mean split mind. Split, a split mind, that's where the word comes from. Psychotic as a person who has a psychosis or an abnormal mind. His mind does not level to the normal that human beings naturally move toward. Paranoid as a supposed hostility toward others. When you say, oh, that person is paranoid, uh, that means uh, he has a hostility toward others that has no reality based upon it. Oh, you hate me. Oh, you tried to poison me. You put, food, you put poison in my food. Then we say, that person is paranoid. And then we have the word demented. It means out of one's mind. It means he has lost control of his mental capacities to function in a normal relationship to truth, to facts, and to other human persons. Then we have the word neurotic, which pertains to nerves and nervous disease affecting the mental attitude. We have the word hallucinations, which is a suffering from illusions, of false notions, false notions. The mind does not, does not conceive reality in its perspective to truth. And, and then we say that person is hallucinating in, in, because he, he has an illusion that is a false illusion. He says, uh, this person over here did that, and in reality, they didn't do it. They says, my husband, he did something over here, and in reality, he didn't do it, so they are what we call hallucinating. And number seven, maladjusted. It means uh, that you're badly adjusted to everyday life. It means you don't make up the beds, you don't cook the food, uh, you, you don't dress properly, and you have become maladjusted to the norm of what we call fine living, beautiful living, or human living. The word eccentric is in their dictionary. It means deviating from the recognized or usual character of things, that he is an eccentric person. We have the word delusions, which means a false mental conception uh, resistant to reason. When a person has a delusion, he has a false mental conception to, to resistant to reason. He will resist reason, and we say, well, you've got a delusion. Uh, you, you say, uh, that bench is, 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 is yellow. He says, no, it's red. And, and at that moment, you say, you have a false mental conception, and it resists reason. You, you say, no, 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 it, it, it is yellow. He says, no, it's red. And, and so that's what we say about a person having delusions. Now, these are all, these are all uh, medical terms for the human mind in its relationship to proper functioning. Uh, we have the word uh, catatonic most frequently seen in schizophrenia uh, with a muscular rigidity and a mental stupor. It's, it means it's, it's gone a long way into the problem uh, that they cannot naturally normally eject themselves uh, out of. They have to have help in order to remove themselves from it. We have the word hebephrenia, uh, which means childish behavior. Uh, and adult of 40 begins to act like a two-year-old having hallucinations and emotional deterioration. And then we have the word maniacal, mean wild, wild, widely insane and raving. 
then he is in a maniacal situation. Then we have the word amnesic, which means a loss of memory, that you have no correlation to yesterday, no correlation to last week, no correlation to last month, and you're suffering in a state of amnesia, which is in the, in the, in the mental situation that we're teaching about at this time. We have the word a pseudoneurotic, which involves serious thought disturbances and found to be severely disabling. That means that they, they have broken down, they don't carry on a conversation with you, uh, they, they don't reason with you about the needs of today and the taking care of the, the business as it should be taken care of, uh, then they are, are a pseudo-neurotic. We have the word hysteria, uh, violent emotional outbreaks, uh, a perversion or sensory or, or motor functions. Now, you will find some of these words in everyday language. But really, uh, the, the everyday people using them don't understand the medical uh, meaning behind them. I thought when, when a man in the medical profession, and he's a scientist, and he writes that word uh, hysteria down, he don't mean the same thing you mean. Uh, he means that that person has violent emotional outbreaks beyond his control as a medical scientist. He means that they have perversions of sensory and, and motor functions, that the perversion of his motor functions, that means his motor mind up here does not function and relate to truth, and that he has hysteria. Now, then you have the word depersonalization, loss of one's personal expression or characteristic personality. Now, these are things that uh, you, that minister, should go into at, at length. You should take uh, maybe three or four or five of these and minister on them for a whole session uh, with people. Uh, a, personal, a person in a state of depersonalization means a loss of one's personal expression. Uh, he, he was Jim Jones, and he's not Jim Jones anymore. He was Tom White, but he's not Tom White anymore. Uh, her, she, she was uh, Sarah Riley, but she's not Sarah Riley anymore. Uh, she has entered into a state of depersonalization of the loss of one's personal expression or characteristic personality that they grew up with and understood. And as I told you, these, these are the way that people determine who has schizophrenia. All right, uh, derealization, the loss of ability to tell the real world from the imaginary world. That is a great word there. A derealization to where a person has no ability to know whether that's a flower or whether it's a dog. I'm not sure whether there's a dog there or a flower there. Then that person is in an area of derealization in their minds. And uh, what can bring them out? Disassociation is a split in the conscious process as if belonging to another person. Now, th th those are some of the terms that if you uh, deal with schizophrenia in any book, uh, those are terms that you will have to come to understand and, 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 and to get with. Now, it is a solical problem. We've, we've gone through that, and so we won't go back through that. It's your mind, your emotions, and your will. The effects of it is the problem begins mostly in, in the mind. The devil hates the mind because it is the throne of your human personality. And he hits on the throne to take over the throne. The human mind refuses certain forces of reality. Then the mental in instability affects the emotions. And then fear, anger, outrage, tears become outbursts of unreality. Then it affects the will to do or to be anything. This destroys the will. Loved ones and friends are baffled. They seek a medical assistance, but often it terminates with a broken family, and you have to go to a hospital. When the schizophrenic is sent away to a hospital for the mentally deranged, it affects other members of the family with sadness and the eternal question of why in the world did it ever happen? It is a sad situation. It is probable that a person with a dual personality is tormented by an alien entity. Schizophrenia is certainly an abnormal and mental torment. Often we know what a thing is by what it does. For example, does the schizophrenic love God? Or is he or she as sociable as other members of the family? Does the schizophrenic rise to high levels of achievement? Is he or she a leader in his community? The answers of these, of these questions would help one to identify schizophrenia. I've never personally known a person with a split personality to be a real spiritual leader for anybody. Schizophrenia has no apparent benefits for its affected person. This reveals to us schizophrenia is not from God, and that's a great truth for you to know. Except for children born abnormally, I do not believe Satan can get a firm hold upon a person to the extent of schizophrenia unless Satan is permitted to. Now that's what you've got to know. That's what you've got to know. The Bible tells us to resist the devil and he will flee from us, James 4 and 7. This means that from our youth we should try to be like Jesus in all of our actions, to resist the devil in all areas of our life. In so doing, we discover the secret of normal mental activities and living in our lives. Most people 
for the broken personality is a result of decisions which were made by that person Bob. You ought to underline that. That these abnormal situations come uh, because, uh, because of decisions that we made and they are not the proper decisions that should be made. I would not say a person considered to have a split personality would necessarily be demon possessed. I have to tell you that. It may be that he is only oppressed of the devil. In Acts 10 and 38, Jesus of Nazareth came to heal those who were oppressed. In a case of healing, a person of, of schizophrenia, the minister, uh, the, the minister or one who prays, would need to possess divine authority to rebuke an oppression upon that person and to set them free. I know from many experiences uh, that, that Christ can heal mental illness. Now, I've known dozens and maybe hundreds of them as simply as he can heal physical illness. There's no difference whether he heals a hand or whether he heals a mind. Because he designed and created the entire human personality, no human need is beyond the healing power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Bible relates amazing deliverances from mental illness. You find that in Mark 5, uh, 2 to 15. You find that in Luke uh, chapter 9, verses 38 to 42, where Jesus Christ moves right in and he destroyed mental illness and restored those people to being absolutely normal. Whatever Jesus did do and could do, the church can do and does do. So we can deliver people from schizophrenia. It can be uh, a demon power, and it can be an abnormal situation that has not deteriorated into the area of possession until that moment. So deal with it as it is. Deal with it humbly, deal with it spiritually, deal with it positively, and let God set people free. He's in the freedom business. We are not afraid of situations. We are not afraid of them. We just move in on them, whatever area they're in, and say, Lord, we believe you to set them free. We thank you, Father, for, for teaching in the Word, and we thank you, Father, that the church today has a job in the world to do. Help us to do it well. Bless every neighbor needing prayer, and restore by the power of the living God, everyone that needs it. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, let it be.